last week, Steve Karras came along and um, he preached on a, on a passage from us, a passage from the book of Romans. And that letter to the Romans, I think, has been one of the most influential books of the Bible in recent history. Our head pastor here, uh, Ray Galea, wrote a whole book on just chapter 8. Uh, we spent a whole term just preaching through chapter 8. And so what this shows us is that Romans is obviously, without a doubt, one of the more powerful parts of Scripture. And I think we're in love with Romans because of how clear it is. It has this like, beautiful and yet simplistic wording about it that tells us all these things about God. You know, it was the book of Romans that inspired the church to change 500 years ago. And so I think we ought to thank God for the book of Romans. I think we ought to thank God for what he's done through it and how he's moved the church forward using the book of Romans. But as time rolls forward and society changes, I think it's time the church starts paying more or less and more attention to this book here, the letter to the Colossians. As our society strives towards accepting uh, more, more different beliefs and different gods, I think that we need to start paying more attention to the book of Colossians. And this is one of Paul's prison letters. And so that means that Paul was actually in prison when he was writing the letter. And he was writing it to uh, this city called Colossia. And Paul was very aware of what was happening to this young church. The city had many gods and temples to gods. They had influence from the Roman gods, the Greek gods, and even gods from Asia. And the city was very pluralistic though. So what that means is that they believed in all, the sorts of, all these different gods together. They worshipped them all together. Kind of like modern day Hinduism, where they worship all gods. Which is not so much a problem for the society, but it's a problem for the church. See, when you become a Christian, you make this bold statement that there's only one God... And there's only one way to God. And so when these pagans, these people that believe in all these gods, see these Christians going around and proclaiming one God, what are they going to say? What are they going to call these Christians? They're going to call them bigots or intolerant. They're going to call them stupid. In fact, in Colossae, it's likely they were persecuted and killed. But how much is this starting to sound like our world today? Christians are mocked more and more for their beliefs every day. If you turned on the news yesterday, you would have seen the Kmart incident, where Kmart banned the words Jesus, Christianity, God, Bible, Jewish from their photo booths. If you turned on the news in the last couple of months, you could have seen the mockery the media and Rugby Australia have made out of Israel Folau, a man hated for his beliefs, a man mocked because he simply posted something about the Bible. And what about school students? There are many people out there in government who don't want scripture to be taught in schools anymore. It has been deemed offensive. What a frightening world we're moving towards. But it's nothing new. Colosseus suffered from the same kind of trouble. The church throughout all of history has suffered in similar situations and the church will continue to suffer in similar situations. But when this happens, the church has two options. It can stand firm in the truth and face the persecutions that come with that or bend our own beliefs and become a church that accepts many gods. And my fear is that the church across the world is choosing the second option. To remain liked. To maintain our image of tolerance and niceness, we are sacrificing the belief that Jesus is the only way. And I'm sickened by the fact that some churches would rather raise, <coughs> raise rainbow flags than raise the banner of salvation. I'm disgusted that churches would preach for wealth in this world than glory in the next. And I'm astounded that any church would forsake God's assigned genders for the world. For the sake of tolerance, we forfeit our right to belief. For the sake of getting, a, getting along, we say all roads lead to God. And for the sake of unity, we let people go unwarned about the truth of, gospel, of the gospel, that Jesus is the only way. We don't see the evil in worshipping other gods because we don't, we don't see the spiritual war that is at play. And Colossea was headed in the same direction that we are. In order to make peace with society, they made Jesus one of many gods. Paul therefore writes this letter, to combat that. He wants to encourage them not to take that path. And as I read through the book of Colossians for this sermon, I couldn't help but see a book of war. A book that encourages Christians more and more to stand with Jesus, to fight for him and his message, to be immovable in him. The greatest fault of the Colossian church is that it never saw the true evil of worshipping or accepting other gods. And I don't think we see the evil of worshipping or accepting other gods. The greatest evil of all the religions in the world is not their, not their violent, violent crimes, it's not um, the things they do, it's what they worship. The greatest evil of all the religions of the world, that includes Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, atheists, Muslims, Jews, 
Hindus, their greatest evil is that they worship Satan. They don't know God, they don't know Christ, and they develop their own fake gods that do not exist. And that non-existent God is Satan. And that's the great deception. That's his trick, right? That's how he's deceived the world. It's not just some strange satanic cults hiding in garages that worship Satan. It's the whole world. And so that's the war we wage. And I can't help, but as I read through this book, to imagine a war scene. I can't help but think of the battle we're meant to be fighting. I can't help but think of the spiritual battle that is waging across the entire world right now. If we could see that we are not in a time of peace, if we could see the true state of people, then maybe we'd be more urgent to proclaim the gospel, that we might just take mission more seriously. And I believe that tonight, God wants us to start thinking about ourselves as soldiers in this world. That tonight, he wants us to look across the world and see a battlefield. That tonight, he wants to make immovable soldiers in this room. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, we, um, we come to you tonight with a, um, a shyness to mission, I think, a shyness to evangelism, um, something we all think we should do and think that we, um, we ought to do, um, but that we struggle to do. Um, Father, but your call was to go out into the world and make nations and uh, make <coughs> disciples, Lord, and so, Father, I pray um, that tonight, that, that is our mindset, Lord, that um, the call is too great to, um, to ignore that the call is too great to continue on ignoring, to continue on forgetting about, Lord. Um, that tonight, Lord, that we'd be, um, that we'd be focused on, on looking across the whole world and seeing the desperate need for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me set the scene. In this passage, Paul and his team are like the special forces. They are specially empowered and given special weapons to complete their mission. And their mission is to go behind enemy lines, to go into enemy territory and free captives. But along the way, the enemy, Satan, seems to have delivered a massive blow to this crack team. Paul has been captured, but he manages to write this note, a letter that he sends into the high country in Colossea to soldiers who aren't captured. And the start of the note simply says, call the commander, bring in more firepower. You know, we spent some time about two weeks ago talking about prayer, And I think prayer is like a military radio, a direct line of communication between soldiers and their commander. Paul is asking the soldiers to pick up their military radio and call the commander to bring in more firepower, to blow the door of this prison so Paul can go out and complete the mission, to save souls and to rescue captives. And Paul hits on three things in this passage. He talks about how to pray. He talks about praying for missionaries and he talks about how to witness or to share the gospel. And what I think is most striking in this passage about evangelism is that Paul spends more time talking about prayer than he does on how to present the gospel. We have a desperate need for God when it comes to mission. So the first point Paul makes, we need to be in constant communication with the commander. We need to be regularly praying to God. And let me, let me tell you something, you can get better at prayer. You can be better at praying. Imagine our military radios. The more you use them, the more they charge. That's how prayer works. The more we pray, the more conscious we can be of our prayers. The more we talk to God, the more effective our prayers will be. And Paul uses some strong language here. He says the word devote, devote yourself to prayer. And when I hear the word devote, I think of marriage. I think of a husband and wife devoting themselves to each other. So let's get married to prayer. As Christians, let's get married to prayer. Let's fall in love with prayer. Let's do life with prayer. You know, you wouldn't lock your husband or your wife in a closet all day, pull them out for five minutes and talk to them and tell them that you love them. So why do we do that with God? Why do we ignore God all day and pull him out for five minutes and talk to him? Praying is more than praying before meals and at church. Praying is not some sort of ritual like the other religions do. It's a relational communication with the Heavenly Father. And you know what? The enemy fears prayer. Satan hates it when we pray to God. So the enemy has these communication blockers in the atmosphere that try and stop us from using our radio. And I think the most common communication blocker that Satan uses, the most common way that he tries to stop us from praying, is by distracting us. You know, we have all these things that take up our free time that we never pray. It's funny how quick we'll pull out our phones to connect to the world, but so slowly we'll drop to our knees to connect to God. When you're on the bus, 
on your way home? Do you go straight to your phone or straight to God? I think one of the most effective ways to do evangelism is to pray that God will do it. We can use these spare moments for prayer. If we can use these spare moments for prayer, how much better prayer will we be? How many more people would be prayed for? You know, there's this app you can download that I didn't download that tells you how much time you spend on your phone and on what sites. If I were to download it, I imagine that it would be about four hours a day. And that's four hours that I could have been praying. So use your free time wisely. Make a no phone day once a week. Let's see how addicted you really are because phone use, I believe, is the modern day addiction. Maybe you need to remove your phone from your prayer life in general. You know, when you're praying in the very presence of God and that buzzing and beeping sound keeps happening in the background and it becomes too much for you and overcomes you and you forfeit God for your phone, maybe that's when you know that you need to have your phone turned off during prayer. Maybe we need to start forfeiting our distractions. Another way Satan tries to stop us from praying is by making us tired. How many of you have fallen asleep during prayer? How many of you are suffering from broken prayer lives because of how tired you are? How many of you are falling asleep right now? Satan tries to win the battle of prayer, of morning prayer, the night before. If he can make you stay up to watch one more episode or play one more game, or text for just one more hour, then he'll win the battle the next morning. He knows you'll be too tired to pray. He knows you'll be ineffective in your prayer. If he can limit your sleep to five or six hours or four hours, he'll win the battle. God designed you to be most effective when you get eight hours of sleep. You are meant to spend one third of your life asleep. Listen to God's design and sleep enough so that you'll be effective in your prayer life. And be aware that you have this military radio, that you have a line of communication between you and the commander, that he's the one who's going to drop the bombs, that he's the one who's controlling the war, and because of that, he's the one I want to be connected to. If God is in control of all of this, then we want to be most connected to him. And Paul moves on from talking about praying for ourselves to praying for missionaries. And Paul has sent this letter in Colossea to call the commander for the sake of him and his team. He instructs them on what to tell the commander. And Paul wants the Colossians to pray for two things. That God would provide a way for Paul to continue to preach the gospel and that he would preach it with clarity. Our missionaries need prayer. You know, as I read this passage, I couldn't help but think of the Borg family. Some of those kids came to our youth group. They were involved and heavily involved in our youth group. And we sent them over to Malta. And I can't help it as we think about praying for missionaries and and feeling this guilt that maybe we haven't prayed enough for them. But this passage is the answer on how to pray for them. How can we best pray for them? How can we best pray for our missionaries? And Paul answers in this passage and he asks the church to pray that a door might be opened. And I don't think it's as simple as his prison cell. I think he's praying that an opportunity for the word to come crashing through the hearts of men and women that he's in contact with. And that's the firepower he's requesting. That God would blow open the door on the shut hearts of men that they would hear the gospel and be saved. And now Paul knows the difference between a regular opportunity and a supernatural opportunity, a supernatural door. Paul had this heart. He wanted to go preach the gospel in Asia, but the Bible says that the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him go there. And instead he had this dream and this vision of a man in Macedonia calling. And so Paul went to Macedonia. And when he went to Macedonia, all these people from all sorts, sorts of walks of life came and got saved and became Christians. It was almost effortless for Paul except for the imprisonment and the beatings. But how often is that the case when our hearts have been for a certain people and God opens the door for people that we never thought we'd share the gospel with? Our missionaries need those sorts of prayers. They need opportunities. Now, I've been blessed enough to spend a lot of time with missionaries, particularly missionaries in Europe where it feels like we're losing this war. And in the time I spent with them, I see how much they struggle. I see how much they struggle to form relationship. It's almost a miracle if they could get the word Jesus out, Jesus out in a conversation. There's great difficulties for missionaries in foreign nations. I know some of these difficulties the Borg struggle with too. They have to learn to communicate with a different culture, to have relationships with people that don't even eat the same food as them. You know, in the Middle East, 
Missionaries have to be so cautious and so careful before they can share the gospel because they might be dobbed in or killed. The same across Asia. And Paul is praying the same thing in this letter, that God would make opportunity for the gospel to be shared even in the hardest places, that there would be supernatural opportunity. But it's his next line that I find the most interesting. He says the mystery of Christ, and in the same sentence that he might make it clear. For you lovers of English, it's like an oxymoron, mystery and clear. They don't, two don't go together, they're opposites. So what is Paul trying to say here? Well, I don't think he's trying to say that this mystery of Christ is God trying to trick everyone, that he's trying to trick everyone and make it hard for them to believe in Jesus and that Paul's job is to make it clear. Rather, I think what he refers to the mystery of Christ, he's talking about making it clear why Jesus came. He's talking about the fact that the Son of God would go to the cross and die for the sins of humanity. That doesn't fit with the world's thinking. That doesn't fit with the philosophy of the world. And that's the mystery that Paul is talking about and he wants to make so clear to everyone. He wants to be clear that Christ, God incarnate, died for the sins of the world and that whoever believes in him and will repent will have eternal life in him. And that's the message that saves and that's what, God, that's what Paul is, should be proclaiming so clearly. But I think the enemy has dropped a lot of smoke bombs in this part of the world. He's dropped all these, all these flashbanks everywhere and made the gospel seem hazy. If you look around Sydney, look how many different churches there are that have something to do with Jesus but aren't quite there. Look at how many churches have you know, something to do with the gospel but don't quite understand it. And I'm talking about Catholics and Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. They get something but not all of it. But what I think is the most concerning part is the number of people in Christian churches that have a haziness about God. I quite often jump ahead and think about world mission straight away but the people that might need the gospel the most might be in this room tonight. So I've been out talking to youth on the streets before and, and I asked them, why do we celebrate Christmas? And these, these youth come from Christian families and their answer is, oh, you know, something to do with Jesus. And what's even more shocking is when you ask them how to get saved and their answer is no different to what you would ask any, anyone else's answer. And that's why we need to pray for our missionaries. That's why we need to preach the gospel with clarity, to get them to remove this pollution in the air that surrounds the cross, that's making the cross seem less visible. I know the Borgs need prayer in Malta, where Catholicism has blinded most of the population. The smoke screens of Mary worship and confession boxes and saint prayers and certain prayers, other prayers that have made Jesus seem so unclear. But it isn't just a problem in some far away distant place. It isn't just some problem in the back of our minds in another country. No, it's a problem right here. I believe that some of you in this room tonight have smoke across your eyes and you need God to blow it away. Everything that we've said tonight on prayer tells us something. That prayer is a lost art in our culture. And even when we do it, we don't get it. Why is it that we can know the truths of prayer but not pray like we know the truths of prayer? Why is it that we know that we're praying to an all-powerful God but we act like it's more, he's more like a defective genie that may or may not grant my wishes? I want to see passion return to prayer. I want to see pleading again. I want to see people have prayer nights again. I want to see people's first reaction to be prayer. I want us to be especially passionate when we pray about our lost friends. How often do your prayers sound like this? You know, Dear Lord, thank you for this, this and this. And Lord, please help me with my assignments and my exams. And then this back thought happens. And I'm like, oh yeah, Lord, can you please save my friend John? Amen. Do you really care about the salvation of your friends if you only give them half a line in prayer? Do you think you're showing God that you care? And where is the pleading? Where is the desperate cries for mercy on the souls of my friends who do not know you? Where is the lamenting? Some of you do evangelism simply for brownie points in the church. Some of you do evangelism because you know it's the right thing to do. But if we were to go by your prayers, how many of you do evangelism for the sake of your friends' souls? How many of you sweat and plead and cry for salvation to sweep through the lives of your friends? We need to feel a sense of urgency again. We need to feel a sense of desperation when it comes to missional prayer. If you aren't genuinely concerned about the salvation of your friends, then I'm genuinely concerned about yours. Prior to this passage... Paul is giving instruction to Christian households and how they should act as Christians. And what this tells us is that we are all soldiers in this war. That we are all trying to see people saved from the bondage to sin. 
And we need to understand that there are people like Paul who are specially equipped to do evangelism. They're gifted by God to complete this task. But that does not exclude us from the work of mission. We are soldiers too. And Paul instructs us on how to be good soldiers in this war. And the first point he makes is to make the most of every situation you're in. It is literally to bet everything on one situation. We have so many opportunities to share the gospel with people. Now, a couple of weeks ago, my brother had his 18th birthday, and he had about 40 friends stay over at our house uh, for most of the night, and none of them have any idea about Jesus. None of them are saved. None of them have any church background or, or have any idea about the gospel. And they spent the whole night over at my place. And when I went to bed that night, and I read this passage because I knew I was preaching on it in a couple of weeks, and I cried. I wasted an opportunity that night. How often will I ever have 40 youth who don't know Jesus in my house? I didn't make the, I didn't make the most of that opportunity. I wasted it. And what if they never meet a Christian again? What if there's no opportunity in the future for them to hear the gospel? What if they walk all the way to hell because of my failures that night? I don't want opportunities like that to go the waste. I'm sick of wasting opportunities. What is the point of all these relationships and all this talking to people and you know, doing things with people if I don't mention Jesus in them? And you have opportunities like that too. You have it in school, in work, in your sports teams. Don't let them go to waste like I let mine go to waste. And in those moments of struggle, when you're shy or scared or you're concerned about maybe this will wreck our relationship, pray. Pray like I should have done. But how do we do all this? How do we do that? You know, it's so disappointing when we miss the shot. How do we shoot straight in this war? And the answer is to let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Before you can fight wars... You need to know how to hold a gun. And the basics will win this war. So how do you season your conversations with salt and fill them with grace? Salt can mean a couple of different things in the Bible, but I'm fully convinced that in this context, it's talking about that zing, that flavor. What makes some Christians so infectious with this zing? Why do their conversations have so much salt in them? It's because their words are God's words, are so full of God's words. We have all these rules and, and methods to doing evangelism, and they all have some value. But if you don't have that zing about you when you talk about God, then you'll be ineffective. If you don't have that obvious passion about God, then you won't be winning many souls. And I think there are only two things that make your speech salty. There are only two things that have to be done in order to be effective in evangelism and in sharing the gospel. The first is to love God. I know every week... We get up here and, and someone tells you to read your Bible, but I don't know if you put two and two together yet. The more obsessed you get with him, the more he lights up your world, the more you want to talk about him. If God becomes your addiction, then you won't be able to shut up about him. You'll be jealous about him and his glory. You know, there are times in my, my quiet time when I read a passage and I learn something and, and see something so spectacular in God that I haven't seen before and I can't help but tell people, I can't help but tell people about this new, exciting thing about God. But Marcus McDonald, one of the youth leaders here, is the best evangelist I know. Because his whole body changes when he talks about Jesus. His whole personality changes when he talks about Jesus. He literally can't walk past anyone in the street without talking about Jesus. And that's because he's got such a passion for God, he cannot contain it. So what if we all got that crazy about God? You'll all talk about the excitement of your footy team, but you won't talk about the excitement of God. And for you guys that have been Christians for a long time, I sympathize with you guys the most. I understand. You've been in church for so long that you can say Jesus died for you and not feel a thing for God. You've lost the excitement of knowing God. Bring it back. Bring it back. People need to see the zing in knowing God. The other way to give yourself that passionate zeal for evangelism is to be in love with people. 5% of the church is 100% of the evangelism of the church. Only 5% of Christians regularly share the gospel. How much do you have to hate someone to let them go to hell unwarned? How much must you really hate your friends to let them to continue living captured lives? 
We have the key to their cells. We can give them Jesus who can free them. You have people that you love around you, slowly dying and without Jesus. Friends that you cherish. I've had this group of friends for since, some of them since you three. So we've grown up together. We've done life together. I don't think I've loved a group of people more than I love that group of friends. And they, and they have all these memories together. And I know right, if they don't come to Christ, if they don't come to Christ before they die, that those memories are pointless. They're worthless in eternity because I can't share them with them. But then as I think about how much love I have for my friend group, all you guys have friend groups around you that you love with the same desperation, that you want to be sharing memories in heaven with. And they're not just us, but that there are 7 billion people out there who have friends that they love, friends with memories that they want to be sharing it with. That there is a whole world out there that needs this gospel message. And at the present point, I would say something like 90% of the world is marching towards hell. And in this room of a hundred and something people are the few people that are going to stand in their way and tell them to turn around. But who's going to do it? And that's what I want you guys to take home tonight. We're still on this mission. We've been fighting this war for 2,000 years. The battle is still raging. At least 10% of you in this room will be missionaries in a foreign country. And I actually expect that number to be more like 20%. If we can give 10% of our finances to the church's mission, then we can give 10% of our people to the church's mission. And so that means that the question of who is going is not a theoretical one. It's not some idea in the back of our heads. It's a practical one. Who is actually going to go? And so tonight in your groups, ask the question, who is going? Who is going to foreign lands to give them the message of grace? Who is going to places that the Bible hasn't been yet? And where will you go? The battle is raging in what we call the 1040 window, which includes North Africa, the Middle East, and most of Asia. 4.4 billion people are unreached live there, meaning they haven't heard the gospel. And who is better than you? And if not you, then who? There are still 7,000 people groups who haven't heard the gospel at all, and thousands more that don't have the Bible in their own language. And this place here, MBM Youth, this is your training barracks. We're training you for this war out there. Use it like that. And it's not just this 1040 window. Christianity Christianity in Europe is dead in most places and dying in others. Slovenia, Poland, Ukraine, levels of Christianity lower than the Middle East. 0.2% of the population believe in Jesus. That is lower than unreached places. So who is going to go there? Who is going to go share the gospel there? The war is worldwide. Where will you go? Start preparations now and training now. Juniors, learn a second language. Get prepared to speak the gospel in a foreign tongue. Seniors, start working out where you're going to go and make preparations for that so that you'll be there in the next five years. And leaders, I think some of you need to think about World Mission too because if the statistics are correct, then some of you should be packing your bags tonight and taking the gospel to where it hasn't been before. But for those of you staying in Sydney, you are still on the same mission, fighting the same war right here. The nations have come to our shores for a reason. Give them the reason of Jesus. Let them know the real reason they came here. Many of you in the room tonight will be trainers of soldiers, training the next waves to go out and conquer. Your purpose is no less important than those who go to foreign lands. You know, in World War II, The air raid sirens in Darwin saved thousands of people from Japanese bombs. Air raid sirens in London saved thousands of people from German bombs. The air raid sirens in Moscow saved thousands of Soviets from Nazi bombs. But the sound of God's siren, the sound of God's air raid siren has echoed throughout all of history. God has cried out to the nations and warning people to go to the bunkers, to flee to Jesus for safety. And there are these peculiar moments where God so clearly sounds the alarm to the world that thousands hear it and come to him. We call them awakenings or revivals. And we had the great awakenings in North America where thousands of people weren't just saved, they were overcome by Jesus. When men preached in that time, people crumbled before the glory of God. We had the great revival in Wales where one man's prayer changed an entire nation. All throughout England, all throughout England's history, sirens have gone off. 
South Korea has had air raid sirens ringing for the last hundred years, and next year they'll send out more missionaries across the world than the US. I believe that we are on the cusp of another great siren, a global siren, that an outpouring of God will happen that we haven't seen since the cross. And tonight, men in the Middle East will, hear, will have visions of Jesus, and people in China will hear the whispers of Jesus in the alleyways, and I believe that Europe will have one last great awakening. They'll have their own resurrection, that God will call them one last time. That's our prayer tonight. One more time, God. Ring the sirens one more time. Call across the world one more time and make soldiers in this place. Make soldiers who go out and preach where no one has preached and proclaim where no one else has proclaimed. One more time, God. One more time.